Good afternoon to everybody on the East Coast. Uh, good, good late morning to everybody on the West Coast. My name is Derek Bietzel. I am a staff attorney at the National Congress of American Indians. We'd like to thank you for joining today's webinar on protecting tribal social programs. This will be a review of draft joint comments prepared in response to the IRS Notice 2012-75. And this uh, presentation was put together by the organizations listed on your screen the National Congress of American Indians, and those others as well. Um, as, as you look on your screen, you can see at the upper right-hand corner of your screen, there's, a, there's a, a, a toolbox. You can hit the red arrow to expand or collapse your, your, your speaker's box or your panelist's box. And you can also hit, there's two ways you can ask, answer, two ways you can ask questions today. One will be to type your question into the question box and we will answer the questions in the order that they are received. And the other way is to raise your hand. You should see an icon on your, on your attendees box that you can click on and it will show that your hand is raised. When you raise your hand, I will unmute your line and you can ask your question on the telephone. I will now be turning it over to Chairman Ron Allen from the Jamestown Sklalem Tribe. Well, thank you, Derek. Uh, you can hear me all right? Um, I, I want to welcome every. Oh, you, I, you can. Okay. Uh, I want to welcome everybody uh, uh, to the uh, the webinar. I want to first of all um, thank um, uh, NCAI, NAFOA, NIGA, uh, HN, and the other um, entities who have helped us put this together. First of all, I want to definitely express my appreciation. To all the tribal leaders, you know, who have been working on this thing for many, many years, uh, in terms of, of uh, identifying the, the uh, challenges that we have with regard to the IRS and the Treasury um, for both the general welfare doctrine and the uh, taxation um, standing of the tribes, our businesses, etc. So, and, and, and accessing of of, um, of um, uh, tax exempt revenue. So there's a lot of issues on our plate, um, and I know that we're trying to keep them all sorted out. And um, and I know that we've got some, what I consider some wins. Uh, for example, in terms of uh, IRS being responsive to many of our requests. Um, so a big part of what we're doing here is, is uh, continuing to make sure that everything that is on Indian Country's agenda is included on our agenda. But uh, the biggest question for us will be, um, how we go about dealing with the general welfare doctrine or other opportunities that arise for us um, in the commerce, um, excuse me, in the Congress, uh, such as energy credits or or, um, or any kind of opportunity to amend the uh, the 84 t uh, Tribal Government Tax Status Act, et cetera. So um, I think that uh, um, it's, it's really important for us to be staying unified um, and um, and making sure that we're all sticking from the same uh, song sheet when we talk to the Congress or if we talk to the administration uh, um, to the Treasury and IRS. So um, uh, I know that uh, uh, Jackie and Dante and Derek and John and all those guys have put together a really good agenda for this afternoon. Uh, be an opportunity for us to uh, vet where we are, uh, to get some better input on uh, the, the draft uh, position papers and principles that we've been advocating. I know it's going to be on uh, our, many of our regional agendas, such as HTNI and Muset. Uh, so we really do need to make sure that we're reaching out to all of Indian country and keeping people informed that uh, we're championing the cause um, here in Washington, D.C. So I'll turn it over to Jackie, who is going to take it from here in terms of uh, the rest of the agenda and, and manage the different kinds of questions that are uh, going to be raised or, uh, or um, uh, recommendations from the tribal leaders uh, in our staff and lawyers. Okay, I'll turn over to you, Jackie. Thank you, Ron. Um, we appreciate your help in um, providing leadership to this effort and this initiative, as well as so many tribal leaders across the country who have stepped up um, for this for the many years that um, NCAI has been working on tax initiatives. But especially in the last couple years, the effort of the coalition of of, of tribal leaders who represent um, the various regions, the United, Eastern, uh, United South and Eastern Tribes, the Affiliated Tribes of Northwest, California Association of Tribal Governments, Midwest Alliance of Sovereign Tribes, United 
Indian Nations of Oklahoma, Kansas, and Texas. And of course, um, our other sister organizations like the Native American Finance Officers. And that's just a, a, a group of, of, of tribal leaders who wanted to make sure that we uh, coordinated and worked together. And, and so many others have joined in the efforts um, individually and collectively. And it's really bearing um, fruit from the work that we've had in the last uh, two years basically since we had um, that or, an organizing meeting in Mikasuki. Anyway, um, the, as Derek said earlier, the purpose of this uh, teleconference, this webinar today, is really around general welfare. But I thought it would be helpful just to give a quick over, uh, um, overview of, of, of where we are right now in our overall uh, tax um, agenda. Um, because there are so many issues, and I want to make people uh, make sure that people understand that today, even though today's agenda is around general welfare, we really have a lot of other issues that we are pursuing related to tax. We have uh, uh, recently have had some meetings on the Hill related to some legislative proposals having to include things like uh, tax exempt bond financing, general welfare, and um, you know, uh, a, a variety of technical fixes like the pension fix um, that are all related to tax. We also have um, conversations and have been working on ways to deal with state taxation issues um, as tribes are dealing with that, and, and particularly looking at issues around, um, you know, tobacco tax. And, and, and most recently, um, you'll see some of the broadcasts that have come out from NCAI about state streamlined sales tax. And so um, with those, that, that's been an effort that you know, we've been working on for years and years. And, it, and just recently in the Senate last week, they passed their um, provision, which includes tribes. And we'll see what happens on the House side with that dialogue. So stay tuned for a lot of discussion related to tax in various forums. This meeting today, however, is focused on our comments that are due June 3rd. Um, to the IRS and Treasury related to general welfare. Um, but I'd like to start um, uh, to open it up real quickly with Dante just giving a quick overview of our principles of tax. And the reason why we wanted to share that with you is because we know that you have lots of pressing needs related to tax. And we wanted to be able to make sure that um, everybody saw or looked at the principles of tax that it will include your representative issues in our broad statement so that so everyone realizes that um, and hopefully can see all of the tax issues that you have finding a home somewhere in our principles of tax. And of course, if not, we'd love to hear about that. So I'd like to turn that over to Dante from NAFOA, please. Dante? Oh, sorry, Jackie, I was on mute. Um, thanks for that introduction. And uh, I, it's a good, good introduction into the principles document. Uh, the broadcast that we had sent out earlier had an attachment uh, to the document that we're, we're talking about. And we did think it was a good idea to gather tribal leader thoughts around what principles should be guiding us as we take on tax reform. And today we're going to be talking about one aspect of the tax reform agenda. Uh, but there's uh, many other ideas and many other tax initiatives that are being brought up. Uh, so we thought it would be good not just for tribal leaders to confirm their uh, thoughts on the, guiding, the guidance that we should be considering around tax reform, but use this document uh, for uh, congressional staff and for other policymakers uh, in, in various administrations as we move forward. But the document basically goes over, I think, three different aspects that are worth noting. Uh, on why, on how to um, deal with tax issues regarding uh, tribal governments. And the first, of course, is our status as tribal governments. Uh, the idea that tribes are mentioned in the Constitution and also have treaties with the United States. And also a lot of the um, programs and services that have been codified through legislation and, um, uh, and uh, supported through the administrative actions uh, the, the, we feel that these are um, uh, not, don't only express the intent of Congress, but should be used by all the different agencies 
for helping to support self-determination and further uh, the interest of tribes uh, based on the uh, trustee relationship. Uh, and the other principle, um, and just on that government principle, the if you look at how tax reform has come out in the past, it hasn't always supported the idea fully that tribes are uh, should be treated as as governments in in the tax code. Or there's also some uh, uh, parts of the tax code that treat co tribes a little bit awkwardly and give them some authority, but not full authority that other governments have. So we think it's important to treat tribes fairly when it comes to tax uh, the tax the tax code and fairly. Uh, in, in a manner that uh, other governments get treated, and also in a manner that respects how tribes uh, govern. And that gets to the final principle, which is looking at uh, the, um, the idea that tribes use economic development, uh, the revenue from economic development, to support a lot of the programs and services. And that's a little bit different from other governments who rely on a robust tax base uh, to do the same thing. And then finally, uh, that tribal leaders have the additional responsibility uh, promoting culture and ceremony, the ceremonial practices within their tribes. And that is something that is different uh, with uh, tribal elected tribal leaders than it is with other elected government leaders. So as we move forward with the tax reform, uh, whether it's the general welfare <coughs> guidance that we're going to be talking about today uh, administratively, or with the other tax reform efforts, um, we want to promote government fairness. And um, this is especially important at this time because the federal budget is, of course, continuing to tighten. And there is a, a lot of pressure for tribes to uh, pursue economic development to um, fund these programs and services that are um, being cut back. So we were hoping to use this principles document um, to uh, really look at the tax code and make sure that it incents capital, gives tribes full access to other uh, government tools, uh, respects the elected leader decision making, and advances uh, the ability of tribes to build an economic base, and then finally promotes uh, certainty of jurisdiction so that tribes can diversify their economic base. So. With that, uh, I'll turn it back over to Derek to start the general welfare discussion. Well, and I just want to say this is Jackie. I, I, this principles document is really the basis, which in the foundation, what gets us to the general welfare piece. So, um, thank you, Dante, for for going ahead and doing that. Yeah, thank you, Dante. Uh, this is Derek. I just wanted to say we're getting questions um, already about whether or not we'll be sharing the slide presentations. We definitely will. We have a list of everybody that registered. So as long as you registered with the with the accurate email address, we'll just cut and paste that into a um, an email and email you uh, the presentation, the draft principles, as well as the draft comments. Once again, and a copy of this webinar, which we are recording. So we'll make that available to you as well. Uh, right now, I'm going to turn it over to our general counsel, John Dossett, and he's going to lead us through the draft joint comments, which should be loading on your screen right now. Thanks a lot, Derek. This is John Dossett um, with the NCAI staff. Um, you know, just by way of introduction, I think most of you are likely familiar with the problem that was created with um, a, really a broad audit effort by the by the IRS, and particularly where the IRS would look at tribal programs uh, provided to tribal members and intended to see those programs as disguised per capita payments that were subject to taxation unless, in the IRS's view, there was, um, there, there was a specific financial need for each program and there had to be means testing for that. And, and in and tribes, their programs weren't structured that way. Uh, for the most part, if the tribe provides a, a, an educational benefit, they provide it to all of their students. If they provide a benefit to elders, they provide it to all of their elders and, and not only to those elders um, who have a financial need. Um, and and it, it caused a great deal of uh, problems and grief and audits throughout the country and, and with tribes all over the country. And as a result of that, tribes you know, brought this issue more and more to NCAI, to the Obama administration and, and tried to get a, a solution. And the result so far is this interim policy that we're now providing comments on, 
these comments are due on June 3rd. What you see in front of you is a draft, and what we really want to get from you is, is you, we want to go through this with some of the tax attorneys we've been working with who have been so very helpful, and, um, and then we want to get your comments and views on this so that we can improve uh, our comments and collectively we can continue to communicate with the IRS and try to improve this policy. I think our general perception is this, this, um, this new you know, draft policy out of the IRS and the guidance is, is a good step in the right direction, uh, but there's, there's more work to do to, to make it even better. Um, that's the introductory statement, and going on to the second point is, is that we asked for a suspension of the audits. Um, you know, the, the IRS has been applying these doctrines inconsistently with various tribes around the country um, and, and really has a very aggressive audit campaign. Tribal leaders have made it pretty clear that they would like these audits uh, to be suspended. So if you look at the draft comments here, you'll see that right off the bat that we've asked them to suspend the comments. And this is you know, not every kind of audit that there is. I mean, I think it would be very difficult to convince the IRS to stop auditing payroll taxes and those types of things. But on the general welfare component of this, um, we the comments ask for a suspension. So there's a period of time where tribes uh, can come into compliance, where they can work on their documents, uh, and where they can uh, also there can be training of the field agents for the IRS. Um, there's been a lot of problems with misunderstandings out in the field, which is really where a lot of these issues origi originated. Um, and better training for the field agents seems like a, a really important component. Um, with that, you know, we're getting into kind of the, the general principles. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Robert Yoder if he'll help us out a little bit in going through um, the general principles of this and the safe harbor uh, and the, and the, the written guidelines. Uh, Robert Yoder um, is a tax attorney in the Southwest. He's been you know, very helpful with this, and he, he really helped in drafting a lot of these comments. Um, and so the, the first part I'm going to ask him about this, and the, the first question I want to ask you, Robert, is what is a safe harbor? You know, so much of this guidance r relies on the use of a safe harbor. Um, and, I, you know, I'm not a tax attorney, and it, it, for me, I found the, I found the you know, exactly what does a safe harbor do? How safe is it? Is the tribe only protected from, let's say, penalties and interest, or are they completely protected if they take the steps um, provided in this notice? Um, I wonder, maybe you could start there with some of the uh, discussion of what a safe harbor is, uh, and then and then go in a little bit more into the the general principles and the um, and the the needs uh, assessment under the safe harbor outlined in the guidance. Sure. Thanks, John. Uh, and this is Robert. Um, the the safe harbor concept is really a, a particularly helpful concept for tax doctrines that that tend to rely on general and sometimes not well-defined principles. Um, and the general welfare exclusion, of course, fits, fits well into that because for, for years we've had, uh, as is pointed out in the comments, sort of uh, three overriding principles that, that apply to determine when, uh, when we're entitled to the general um, uh, welfare exclusion. And, and, and they've been general concepts like it's got to be made pursuant to a government program for the promotion of the general welfare that's on... Uh, a needs basis and, and doesn't represent compensation for services. Well, all of those criteria tend to be uh, subject to a fair amount of facts and circumstances and interpretation. So uh, a safe harbor really is, is designed to provide an optional way to get a, a more certain IRS result on specific tax issues like the general welfare exclusion. Uh, and it does so by, uh, by setting forth some criteria that are typically better defined than those general principles that would otherwise, otherwise cover the rule. So by, by complying with a set of specific rules that are, that are hopefully easier to define, uh, the IRS provides us some assurance that, uh, that we'll get that tax treatment. Uh, however, and, and of course, by, by complying with those specific criteria, like the ones that are set forth in the current notice, it gives us a great deal more certainty that if we can comply with these specific criteria, we, we know that we can take advantage of, of, the, uh, of the tax, uh, tax rules and, and, and advantages. Uh, however, the important thing to keep in mind is that a safe harbor doesn't replace the general rules. 
So if you have programs that do not fit neatly within one of the, the safe harbor criteria, it doesn't mean that you're foreclosed from applying or, or, or availing yourself of the, of the general uh, welfare exclusion. You can still meet it under that, those general principles or the, or the general rules. Uh, one of the areas that tribes may be uh, familiar with uh, that, uh, as an example, is under the Miners Trust area. For years, we've had safe harbors for uh, uh, gaming-related Miners Trusts uh, to, to achieve uh, tax, uh, tax deferral on those trusts if we meet certain safe harbor guidelines. But it's not the only way. Tribes can also establish trusts outside of that safe harbor. And for the general welfare exclusion, it's the same. Uh, same principle. If we can comply uh, comply with a, a nice, easy to follow set of uh, safe harbor rules, we know we've got good assurance that we'll get t favorable tax treatment. Yet we still have the ability to go outside of the safe harbor uh, to uh, uh, to achieve those results for programs that just don't fit within. And and, and as everyone knows, uh, you know there there will be many tribal programs that just won't fit into any sort of safe harbor. Uh, the general principle that we really tried to focus on uh, in these concepts or, or the, uh, the comments uh, was really to emphasize the need for deference to tribal governments in establishing these programs uh, and hopefully to uh, emphasize in, in the final rule that, uh, uh, that, uh, that tribes are still free to establish their programs, whether within or outside of the safe harbor. Uh, and that uh, that hopefully uh, there's an emphasis placed on the fact that that and a recognition that that tribes are are the best suited to determine what their own uh, community needs are and uh, the the best ways to to uh, address those needs. So that that type of flexibility is what we really tried to emphasize under the general principles. All right, that's very helpful. Um, Maybe you know the the next part of uh, the comments is you know section four. It's on page five, uh, and it you know it it gets a little bit more into the the details that are required for the safe harbor. Maybe you could talk about some of your comments on on those aspects. Yeah, the uh, the safe harbor. Um, keep in mind is, uh, or the current guidance is broken down into really two types of safe harbors. One is what we've called the the safe harbor uh, on needs, and then the, the the second one is really some safe harbor relief on compensation. The definition of compensation that's, that's primarily in the spiritual or cultural uh, leaders uh, area that will be talked about a little later. Uh, with regard to the the safe harbor. Uh, for needs, which is really the the bulk of the uh, uh, of the guidance, and, and really has been one of the most challenging areas for tribes to uh, to address. Um, and as you'll recall, uh, for for years we've argued that um, uh, that there should be a greater recognition uh, in some of the field audits uh, that that there are certain needs that are so important to tribes that we've called community-based needs in, in some cases that that uh, tribes should be able to provide those types of programs with, with tax on a tax-favored basis without having to go through an individual financial uh, needs review. Uh, so uh, under that, that section four is where we really try to uh, address and, and go into uh, the specifics of, of how the safe harbor is set up and, uh, and then respond to the specific uh, uh, issues and questions that have been raised so far by by some of the input that we've received, uh, and uh, I know that we've got uh, uh, individuals on the call who are going to go into the into greater detail as to those specific safe harbors. But the overall structure of of the needs uh, safe harbor is, is really broken down into uh, two criteria. There's procedural requirements that have to be met, uh, and if those procedural requirements are met. Um, then we are, are provided uh, five distinct categories of the types of benefits that, uh, that will be deemed to meet this need-based safe harbor. And they're broken down into uh, uh, housing, education, elder and disabled, other and cultural and religious categories. Um, and and those those categories tend to be some some really helpful categories, and, and I think it's uh, the the guidance that came out 
uh, does reflect a lot of, of what was requested during that consultation period. Thanks, Robert. Um, you know, one of the questions I had w was about, you know, one of the criteria for the safe harbor is that the, the program can't be lavish or extravagant, um, which, you know, it seems like a, a bit of a subjective determination, you know, to d decide whether or not a, a program is lavish or extravagant or not. How, how will it, you know, how will that work when the IRS reviews that and, and what would it mean if they determined that it, it was a lavish program? Well, that's um, a, a, a great question. Most of the procedural aspects, I think, of the of the safe harbor harbor, uh, my clients have, have found uh, uh, quite reasonable, and and are are provisions that uh, uh, that uh, are typically complied with anyhow. The way tribes set up most of their programs. The one new concept uh, in in that procedural sort of list that, that's introduced is this concept of lavish and extravagant. And uh, the one thing that we touch upon in the comments is that we're hopeful that, uh, that we can get some additional guidance, that that lavish and extravagant criteria is really seen as, uh, as, as a mechanism uh, to prevent abuses in, in program uh, administration and, and design rather than as a mechanism to sort of uh, second guess or perform a cost analysis type type review of each program on a on a on a benefit by benefit basis. So one of the things that we're hopeful at is that the lavish and extravagant uh, restriction uh, will be uh, something that that still uh, considers the deference to tribes in establishing their programs and that it's a mechanism merely to prevent abuse and not to uh, sort of second guess the way programs are designed. Uh, in, in my experience, there's, uh, at least with my client base, there's very few programs that are established that, that I think anyone would, would consider lavish or extravagant. But what we want to prevent or hope doesn't happen is that um, we have the ability of uh, field agents to sort of substitute their judgment in for, uh, let's say, the materials used to repair countertops. You know, does it have to be the least expensive materials or uh, or, or do, do tribes have flexibility uh, in that regard? If you repair a home, is it wood siding is more expensive than vital siding? You know, do, are we restricted to only using vinyl siding? That's the kind of uh, sort of uh, bushes and weeds that we hope that this standard doesn't get into, uh, and it would be, uh, I think, helpful to get some confirmation that. Uh, that it is just intended to prevent abuse and not substitute judgment for the tribes. All right, thank you, Robert. Um, hey, Derek, you know, the, there's, you've likely, you said you meant, you've got to receive a few questions already. Maybe should we go through a few of those and then after that we can get into the specific areas like housing and elders. Um, does that make sense? Yes. Um, well, the questions I had were more um, geared towards whether or not we were sharing the presentation, and um, we did. We did say that we were going to record this, and we we're going to send out an email to everybody that's attending with the with the presentation, as well as the different documents that we're referencing. Uh, one of the one of the attendees wanted to comment that um, some of the, the the programs that were just being discussed were, were fundamental needs of the recipients. So I just wanted to clarify that they're fundamental needs. And that was the question that we had so far. It's more of a comment. OK, great. Well, um, the, n the next thing we we're going to go over, and you know, we're just kind of going through the comments that these are the draft comments that we've developed so far, are the way that uh, the, the guidance addresses housing programs and, and uh, provided by tribes. And, and we we're going to ask uh, Mary Strait if she could talk a little bit about that area. Mary Strait is a tax attorney with Dorsey and Whitney uh, and has you know, worked with tribes for, for quite a number of years and was, has been very helpful in, in uh, this whole process. Uh, so Mary, maybe you could talk a little bit about the housing programs. Sure. Thank you, John. Um, first, I'll summarize uh, the types of programs that the guidance uh, protects under the safe harbor if the procedural requirements are satisfied. Um, the programs are those that relate to principal residents 
residences and that do one of the following four things. Uh, they either assist in making mortgage or rent payments for residences on or near the reservation. They enhance habitability of housing, such as by remedying water, sewage, sanitation, service, or heating or cooling issues. Or they provide basic housing repairs or rehabilitation. Or they assist in paying utility bills and charges such as water, electricity, and gas. The draft comments um, that we're seeking input on today um, have identified some uh, issues relating to that list in the proposed guidance. And I'll run through what the comments have identified as issues. And of course, we'd be interested in hearing uh, whether there are any others that should be included. The first one is that with respect to the first um, category of programs, the, those that assist in making mortgage or rent payments, there's a limitation uh, for this to homes on or near the reservation. And uh, the draft comments point out that for many tribes, this is not a realistic or appropriate limitation. Um, given that the tribal membership uh, may be dispersed uh, in a large geographical area away, including areas away from the reservation. And another common uh, situation is that a tribe may not have enough land base to build or promote um, reservation living. So uh, the, the comment says that there really isn't any reason under the general welfare exclusion why this limitation should be here. Um, and it's not practical or realistic, so let's get rid of it. The second comment um, says that the principal residence limitation that applies to all of the housing programs in the safe harbor should be clarified to include ancillary buildings um, to the principal residence, such as a barn or storm shelter. A garage would be another, uh, it seems to me. Anything on the, on the site of the principal residence. Third, the draft comments want um, some additional examples provided uh, as to what is considered to enhance habitability of housing within the meaning of the safe harbor. There are some examples given, remedying water, sewage, sanitation, service, or heating or cooling issues, uh, but so that, so, that, um, so that more situations can be recognized without there being questions and uncertainty, the comment suggests that other expenses that should be explicitly included in the list as relating to habitability include roof repair, mold remedi remediation, other remedial measures to ensure structural integrity, integrity um, expenses that uh, assist in getting access to the housing, uh, for example, ADA type um, uh, access, uh, ramps, handbars, et cetera, and other safety related expenditures. The next comment addresses the scope of what is meant by rehabilitation in the safe harbor. Um, how do you draw the line between rehabilitation and renovation? And uh, as currently drafted, the, the comment says the IRS should clarify this. Uh, one possibility, too, would be for uh, the comment to offer a definition of rehabilitation um, if 
uh, if it's thought that that might result in more favorable guidance. Uh, the next one has to do with, well, what, util what is meant by utilities? The examples given are water, electricity, and gas. But what about telephone service, internet access, cable television? Those are, in many cases, traditional utilities. In other cases, uh, the way we get access uh, to the outside world these days. Um, some tribes run their council meetings on, on cable local access channels, for example. Uh, people get onto the internet via the telephone and uh, communicate uh, in important ways that way. So it would be especially helpful to uh, include those specifically as examples of utility. Uh, the next comment deals with what does it mean to assist with mortgage or rent payments? Um, what if the assistance covers the whole payment? Um, I have a client that has built houses for people, for example, and uh, the tribe did obtain a private letter ruling for that because it did have a financial needs test in its program. But uh, for a program that is offered uh, without a financial needs test, is it sufficient um, to assist with an entire mortgage or rent payment uh, and fall within the safe harbor? That word assist is not defined. Um, the next comment deals with down payment assistance. Um, many tribes, rather than subsidizing mortgage or rent payments want to um, help members come up with a down payment. Members in particular who can afford the mortgage payment but don't have the resources uh, to qualify for a down payment of sufficient size to be able to qualify for favorable loan terms or to qualify at all. Um, Often that assistance is as modest or even more modest than some of the other assistance that is on this list. And so um, the comment seeks to have down payment assistance explicitly added to the list. A couple of other things I thought of just reading through this draft comment would be, um, would it make sense to um, include on the list any housing program funded with um, monies provided by the federal government pursuant to NAHASDA. Um, I, I think most IRS agents I've dealt with have been very um, receptive to the notion that programs funded with federal dollars uh, should be qualifying under the general welfare exclusion, but perhaps it would be nice to, to ask that be expressly acknowledged. I had one other thought, but it's escaping me right now, so I'll just put that one on hold. Well, thanks, Mary. This is John. I have one question for you, and that's, um, you know, some of these comments are asking the, the IRS to get very specific about, about particular items, like, like what do we mean by assistance? Can the tribe provide the entire or, or, or only part of the mortgage payment. And I, and I guess my question is, um, are, are we running a risk by asking them to be so specific that we may not like the answer we get? Um, or, and you have more experience with the IRS. Um, yes. So I'm I, sorry. I, yeah, I totally agree with you, John, that that should be carefully considered. Um, it's the same with the lavish or extravagant, and I think the way the draft comment is trying to finesse that is to simply say we assume that's just an anti-abuse provision and not uh, reflecting any any intention to second guess the tribe. On on um, you know they they are all constrained by their budgets, and so isn't that enough constraint? So I do think that um, 
the issue of specific versus general should be thought through very carefully. With some things, you 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 know, you're asking to just add additional illustrative examples, but not tie the tribe's hands necessarily. Um, maybe the IRS kept this assistance purposely vague because it wants the tribe to be able to decide what kind of assistance or how much. Anyway, it's, I think it's something important to consider as we go forward. Well, perhaps we should move on to the next topic. So, so and John, we have some comments and questions. Oh, um, sure. I'm and some hands raised. So what, maybe we can a little questions? bit. So we have the first uh, hand raised is Orene Martin. Orene, um, I'm going to unmute your phone, so feel free to use your, your phone to ask your question. It doesn't look like Aureen's on the phone right now. Um, Aureen, I'm going to go to the next question, and when you dial in, I'll be able to tell that your phone is live, and we'll ask your question then. Uh, we had a couple comments. Uh, some folks were saying that in, in, in light of the down payment suggestion that there are other um, benefits that a tribe might provide, such as closing costs and security deposits and perhaps uh, home loan forgiveness for folks that reach elder status. And I just wanted uh, comments from Mary on, on, those, on those suggestions. I think those suggestions sound very good and maybe could be lumped in with down payment assistance as the type of other assistance um, that that tribes provide. On loan loan forgiveness when when receive elder status, that that's another interesting one. They haven't they haven't really um, explicitly blessed the concept of providing members with a home for for no skin in the game. And I, I guess if if a loan's gonna convert to a grant upon receiving elder status, um, you know, maybe their the elder has already had a lot of skin in the game. And so, you know, maybe the best strategy on that kind of a program is to include it in the elder category. Um, because the IRS has indicated a willingness to treat elders and disabled persons uh, to give them additional safe harbors above and above, beyond the regular safe harbors uh, for everyone. So that might be a, a, the best strategy to deal with that one. Any other questions? I also had another question that came in. Thank you, Mary. Um, this question is from Peggy. It says, these procedures apply to members of Indian tribes, their spouses, and dependents. Our tribe has been having less enrollment of members but more lineal descendants. Therefore, the tribe is seriously considering providing lineal descendants um, benefits such as housing, education, or cultural. How do these procedures apply to lineal descendants who are not dependents? They, they don't. Um, and that's why on page five of the comments, the draft requests that the limitation of benefits to members, spouses, and dependents is too narrow for some tribal communities. Um, so uh, I think that the, the, the thrust of that comment is to allow the tribe to decide who gets the benefits and that if it's um, included in the tribal program criteria, uh, that that should be enough. Robert, did you want to follow up on that as well? No, I, I think that's uh, that Mary's exactly right. Uh, on page five of the comments, uh, we really try to address that issue um, so that there's a greater deference to tribes to determine. Uh, our tribes are really best, uh, I think, equipped to determine the uh, the beneficiaries of their programs. So we're hopeful that that is 
uh, an area that can be changed in the final guidance. Okay, and Robert, I have a general question that was um, asked by Rhonda, and it kind of goes to when you're speaking about the general principles. This question is just uh, in general to the safe harbor. It says, will health benefit programs qualify under the needs for safe harbor? For example, the purchase of insurance or purchase of medicine for tribal members. Well, it's interesting that that, that question is asked, and I know I've had a lot of tribes say, boy, there's a couple of things that seem to be missing, you know, large categories that seem to be missing from the safe harbor. Um, two of which that I've had a lot of comments on are, are, are medical, you know, related issues, health-related issues, and, and, and economic development. And maybe we'll talk about the economic development a little bit later. Uh, but I think that the rationale for not including it, and, and, and maybe we ought to get some uh, some input from from Treasury and IRS on it, is that we were able to secure um, relief for uh, health care expenditures through uh, part of the uh, uh, the Health Care Reform Act was, was Section 139D, and that new section of the Internal Revenue Code expressly addresses uh, health-related expenditures now in, in an express statutory exclusion. So, uh, and, it's, and it's really pretty good language that uh, has been very helpful for tribes in that area. So I think that's probably why uh, uh, health benefits didn't sort of get their own category anymore. Uh, while years ago we had to rely on the general welfare exclusion almost exclusively in that area, now we've got a separate uh, tribal uh, uh, tax provision dealing with that. And again, that's in Internal Revenue Code Section 139D. Robert, do you think it would be helpful if the, if the guidance at least referenced health benefits and referenced the specific code section? You know, I. I, I like the idea of health as a sort of core fundamental um, area that, that tribes have great needs in and that should be presumed to be, uh, you, know, uh, you know, covered under the general welfare exclusion. Uh, but uh, I, I'd be curious to, to uh, uh, I guess, to, to, to hear comments from, from Mary or Kathleen or, or some of the other folks that I know were, were very active in the 139D issues. Um, I, I'm, I'm very happy with 139D, and uh, maybe we ought to, however, um, discuss you know, whether there's still a need to, to request that that be part of the, the, the GWE guidance as well. Kathleen, what Kathleen, do you think? I'll weigh in on that. Um, the one thing that um, uh, 139D does not cover is uh, health needs of lineal descendants or domestic partners. So uh, if a tribe were to decide that it wanted to address the health needs of its larger community, uh, 139D would not do the job because it's so limited to the tribal member, uh, spouse, or legal dependent. That's a great point. Thank you, folks. Um, we're going to take a couple more questions. Uh, we're getting a lot of questions, which is great. Keep them coming. But I will say that we might not be able to answer all your questions, but we will uh, commit right now uh, on the Internet in front of everybody to follow up with you afterwards uh, via email. We're going to go to uh, Kim. Kim, right now, we're going to open up her line so she can ask her questions directly. She has a couple questions that she wanted to ask. Uh, so, um, Kim, right now, your line is unmuted, and you can ask your questions to the panelists. Me? Hello? Yeah, yeah, go we, ahead. We can hear you. Hi. Um, thanks. Actually, I was just uh, noticing that it just throughout the guidance, it seems to be very ambiguous, and it seems like rather than go through each safe harbor area and identify the ambiguous terms and comment on those ambiguities and suggest that there maybe give maybe give tribes flexibility maybe just have one section devoted to um, uh, giving tribes deference in how they interpret these ambiguous terms and maybe urge IRS to expressly defer to tribal interpretations where there is undefined term terminology that's used I mean it seems like we're going through this exercise of picking and picking throughout the guidance of all the undefined, ambiguous terms. And, and it seems like we just had a discussion about the, the scope of the application of the guidance. So rather than go through each individual phrase, it, sounds, it seems like it could make sense 
to have one section devoted to giving deference to tribal interpretations. Also, I think one comment I wanted to raise, just based upon what Mary had indicated earlier in her comments on the housing um, safe harbor area, is that NHASDA is not the only federal housing dollars that benefits tribes. I mean, we can look to USDA, VA, BIA HIP program, you know, and there are probably other federal programs out there that benefit um, housing as well. Um, Jackie would probably know that better than myself. And so it seems like rather than uh, potentially inadvertently um, limit and restrict um, application of, uh, of any of these terms, that perhaps providing um, or drafting some kind of broader catch-all provision that would capture federal statutes and laws that um, where there are federal underlying federal programs that benefit tribes in these safe harbor areas might be a better use. That way we're not limiting ourselves and we're casting the net broadly. Just thought. I think those are excellent suggestions, Kim. Um, thank you. We're going to take one more question on housing and then we'll turn it over to John to move us to education. So the last question we have here is um, it's coming from Alan. He says, when you say rehabilitation is okay but improvement is not, how will changes in the tribe's building code be treated? If the building code now requires certain wiring or insulation or solar, that should not be considered an improvement. It is required by law. How is this going to be dealt with? I, I would argue that even under the existing guideline, that would fall within habitability or rehab because if you're not in compliance with code, it isn't a discretionary uh, expenditure, uh, which renovation might be, you know, remodeling. Uh, that sort of connotes personal choice. So I, I'm not sure you even need to address that in the comments, but you certainly could point that out and seek clarification if you wanted uh, to, there to be no uncertainty. I, I really do like Kim's point, though, on, on uh, making the general comment about undefined terms and deferring to the tribe. Yeah, that seems like a very helpful one. Well, thanks, Mary. Um, you know, now I'm going to ask Kathleen Nillis if she'll talk a bit about educational programs and how they're treated under the IRS guidance. And Kathleen Nillis you, is a, an attorney with uh, Holland and Knight. She also is a tax attorney uh, and has been working with tribes for many years. Thanks, Kathleen. Thanks, John. Uh, so uh, the educational safe harbors uh, fall into three main categories. The first one, and you should see this on your screen, um, really uh, involves ancillary educational expenses. Uh, providing students transportation to and from school, tutors, supplies, which uh, helpfully the uh, guidance has defined very broadly to include even uh, musical instruments, sports equipment, um, and for use in their studies obviously is very broad, broadly defined as well. Now, uh, that, that category clearly applies to all students. Uh, it says, just in case you're wondering if it applies to college students and above, it says in, including post-secondary. And it's obvious from the context that it would also apply, I believe, to uh, K through 12. Um, the second category, um, it focuses on tuition, which for this purpose, it includes in the, in the term tuition payments allowances for room and board. Um, and that's very curious because there's a general exclusion in the tax code under Section 117 for qualified scholarships. And while qualified scholarships used to include room and board scholarships, it now, uh, since 1986, um, the 86 Tax Reform Act, it only provides an exclusion for tuition uh, scholarships as well as books and certain required supplies and equipment uh, that's generally construed rather narrowly. So this this doesn't exactly you know match up in a sense with the code. It provides um, helpfully 
uh, a broad exclusion for the room and board. Uh, but note that this particular safe harbor uh, does not appear to include um, K through 12. Uh, it refers to college or university, educational seminars, uh, vocational education, technical, adult education, continuing ed, and alternative education. Um, so you'll see further down that uh, one of our, our clar points of clarification is we would like K-12 through uh, tuition, and including room and board for this purpose, to also be included in that safe harbor. Uh, and then the third general category it focuses on job counseling and programs that where the focus is placement, training, uh, and that includes expenses for interviewing and training, the tutoring, and necessary clothing for job interview and, and training. Um, so going through some of the comments, um, one of the areas that several tribes have mentioned uh, to us is that um, some uh, scholarships or academic awards are, are uh, particularly structured as grade incentives or, or grade awards. So the question is, um, would they still fit within the safe harbor uh, with the fact that uh, a particular uh, level of achievement is required with that, uh, exclude that or not? Um, so uh, we'll be, and, and I will say this, we've written in the comments the way you're seeing them, we've We've put them out there in a fashion that just raises the issue. But I believe that as, as we're drafting the comments and finalizing them, we'll, we'll simply be making the case for, for why a particular uh, item should be, should be included. Um, uh, so I already mentioned um, K through 12 tuition. Um, and then another large area that um, doesn't seem to be referenced in many have raised it is daycare. Uh, daycare is often provided by tribes as a, a an educational benefit, uh, such as um, a private version of a Head Start program, or it may also be provided uh, as just a, a way of of enabling students who are uh, either single parents or both parents are working. Uh, or both are in school to attend college. Uh, so we will be making the case to include daycare as an educational benefit from either of these perspectives. Um, another area uh, is while the term supplies for use in their studies seems to be uh, quite broad, um, we thought that it would be important to clarify that the supplies needed for extracurricular school activities as well as in, in their studies or in coursework uh, would be covered. Um, and then uh, another area uh, is distance learning and online education. And they, they would appear to be encompassed within the scope of alternative education. Um, but it would be very important to clarify that, that they would be covered tuition for distance learning or online education. Increasingly people are relying on these forms of education and it's not clear that, that uh, distance learning and education, online education always qualify uh, when a scholarship is given um, under Section 117 of the code. Uh, so that, oh, I did and then, again, getting back to the issue of, of preschool, primary, and secondary education, again, clarifying that um, that tuition-related safe harbor does apply to, um, to all of those categories of education, as well as uh, college, university, and other forms of adult education. And I think that wraps up. Uh, do we have any questions in the educational area? Yeah, we have a, a couple of uh, comments um, and, and questions. One question is, uh, does room and board include student rental assistance, for instance, uh, off-campus apartment or conventional homes? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I, I don't 
think that we have that clearly covered here in our comments, and I think that would be a point of clarification because generally the terms quote unquote room and board uh, often you you think of room and board provided by the college or university as opposed to off campus housing. So I think that's that's a very good point. Thank you. Definitely. We also had uh, uh, some suggestions to clarify that the cost of extracurricular activity fees are included, which includes sports participation fees, and, and I know you mentioned that um, as well, Kathleen. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah, we as well as, yeah, not, not just the, that's a good point, not just the equipment, but also the fees that are required for participation in those extracurricular activities. And, and similarly, um, another participant suggested that we include fees such as lab fees, student fees, or other costs charged by the institution. Okay. That's a good point. Okay. Now, all, all very good points. All right. Maybe we should move on to the, um, the elder and disabled programs. And we're going to ask Wendy Pearson to talk about those. Uh, Wendy Pearson is an attorney. I believe you have your own firm out of the Seattle area, if I'm, I, I believe, and, and uh, formerly an IRS, age, IRS agent. She works with many tribes, uh, and we've really appreciated all of Wendy's uh, insight into working with the Internal Revenue Service. Um, Wendy, maybe you can talk a little bit about the um, both the elder and disabled programs, and also the, there's kind of a catch-all section for other qualifying assistance programs. Wendy, are you there? Yes, I'm here now. Sorry, I had my mute on. <laughs> I am out here in Seattle, and I'll just clarify I was not an IRS agent, but I was an IRS attorney, not that ah, that gotcha. holds Sorry me in that. any higher standard. <laughs> um, so uh, yes, elder and disabled programs. Um, so these are, these are programs that have identified, been identified um, in the safe harbor, this, just a laundry list of of programs, if you will, uh, for elders who are defined as uh, members age 55 or, old, or older or disabled members. So let me just um, first go through the, the list of programs that would be exempt and then address the comments for expanding that. So first there are the meals uh, through home delivered pro uh, meals programs or uh, through a community center. There's home care, such as assistance with preparing meals or doing chores or daycare outside the home, local transportation assistance, travel expenses to doctor's appointments and other medical care, transportation costs and admission fees to attend educational, social, or cultural programs um, offered by the tribe or another tribe specifically. And then finally, improvements to adapt housing to special needs, such as grab bars and, and ramps. And before I jump into the comments that, um, that we've had so far or compiled, um, I, I want to comment on, on Kim's uh, suggestion. I, I think it's a good one that perhaps we need to, uh, at least in terms of um, clarifying some of these um, ambiguous terms that um, you know, deference be given to to the uh, tribal governments, and we might also want to add, um, you know, somewhat a, something like a liberal construction kind of clause that uh, any ambiguity should be liberally construed in favor of the tribe. So I, I like that comment. And the other, uh, you, I just want to follow up, John, on your question to Mary about, you know, what about us? adding these specific examples or requesting that they be expanded, does that, you know, corner us? And, and I agree with, with Mary um, that we certainly don't want to be limited, but also I think those of us who represent tribes uh, in audits know that where possible, the IRS will strictly construe any safe harbor. So if, for instance, uh, you know, the um, safe harbor for, in housing calls only for uh, water, electricity, and gas utility payments, then that's what the agent will limit it to. So, so there's some benefit, I think, in, in the work we're doing here to expand the list of examples, 
um, but I, I agree we have to be careful not to just get uh, cornered uh, and limited to only those examples. So that um, those general thoughts. Um, so maybe what we need is both broad terminology, you know, generally housing programs, and then and then also specific uh, terminology uh, as well. Is you know, are, are we saying both? Yeah, I, I think so. I think we're saying, you know, certainly in terms of any ambiguities and, and broad, sort of broader or language, you know, that there's going to be deference to the tribes and that we, we do want, uh, we want this to be a very liberally construed safe harbor. Um, right. But then we also get specific, you know, because we don't want to be limited just to uh, water, electricity, and gas if we also want to uh, um, provide other types of utility assistance, just as an example. So, okay. So, um, so that leads well into the comment on um, some of the ambiguities in the elder uh, programs. The scope of meals, um, you know, um, we're thinking here that it should be applied to all food programs and not just home delivered meals or prepared meals or meals at a community set, uh, center. Um, so, for instance, uh, if money is, is uh, provided uh, for groceries, um, that should qualify. So I think we're asking for clarification and perhaps expansion there uh, on that program. Um, the scope of elder programs offered by the tribe, here again, uh, the limitation is offered by the tribe or another tribe. There may be some programs that are organized by the tribe or another tribe, but offered through uh, another entity, such as an uh, example here is a local symphony. Um, so, so that requires some clarification, I think, just a, sort of a verbiage change there to make it clear that it's not just tribal programs, maybe other community programs sponsored by the tribe. Um, since we've drafted these comments, there we've had some discussion uh, about some of the practitioners on this uh, uh, call here today have clients also who've asked about, um, for instance, what about uh, uh, a cash supplement program for elders that allows them some flexibility in choosing how to use a, a, a cash grant or cash support for the, their specific um, needs, whether it be it a, a transportation or meals or utilities or something like that. So we may, we may want to ask about expanding the, the safe harbor for that sort of um, uh, support. Um, and there's also um, here on item number six, improvements to adapt housing. There's, there's more than just grab bars and ramps that would make a house ADA compliant. And this would probably be covered under the housing program. Uh, safe harbor that Mary discussed, but I think we want to be specific here also that you know any ADA sort of compliance um, requirements should be exempt. So, so that those are the comments I have for elders. You want to take questions on that before I move on? Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Wendy. And to your last point about about the the item six, we had a suggestion that it should also um, be should also include durable medical equipment, medical supplies, and hygiene supplies. And that kind of goes along with what you were saying. And then to, uh, to, to item five, uh, it was suggested that tribes um, usually offer more than just travel expenses and admission fees for different educational, social, and cultural programs. So that should be expanded as well. Um, what are your thoughts on that, Wendy? Yeah, I think that's right. I, I've known, I've it just seems to me that the IRS is um, sort of inclined to cover a lot of transportation expenses throughout here, through all these safe harbors, um, and I, I think that's right. Um, the type of support that should be envisaged is should be beyond transportation, uh, it, certainly for this uh, number five as well, but probably for some of the other safe harbors we've talked about. There's also a general broad question, um, which I guess I'll, I'll let Wendy have the first crack at. It says, um, is there a reason that safe harbors would exclude any service or activity that is otherwise federally funded by the federal government for any other type of community, Indian or not? Is there a reason why the safe harbors would exclude it? 
or not why it would not be included as a safe harbor? Is that the question? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and I think we have a comment, and uh, Jen, uh, I think uh, Robert, um, you could, you might have drafted that part of these comments about, you know, if if the tribal government is providing support that supplants uh, or augments or replaces a federal program um, where there's, that has been underfunded or has been eliminated, let's say, then that should be included within the safe harbor. That should be exempt because if it was exempt as a federal program or a state program, it certainly should be as a tribal government program, especially if um, that, that other government program has been uh, eliminated or is underfunded. Thank you. We have one broad comment, and it was just saying that um, while we're drafting these comments that sometimes things can't be foreseen and that the language has to be flexible enough to capture scenarios that we don't think about now, which I think is a good comment, and that's coming from Kitki. And then we also wanted to take a, um, a question from, from the phone. We have Wanda. Wanda, when I, um, I'm going to unmute your line, and you can ask your, correct, your question directly to the panel. Right now, you are unmuted, Wanda. Everybody can hear you. Is Wanda on the line? OK, we'll come back to Wanda. Hi. Oh, sorry. This is Wanda. Sorry okay. about that. Do, do we still have time? Yes. Cool. OK, well, my basic question is just uh, I've done research on the uh, federal funding opportunities that are, are available to tribes. And so there's about. 350 total, and then out of that, there's a little bit over 40 that are mandatory formula funding opportunities that all federally recognized tribes can obtain. So then my question becomes, if all of those would seemingly constitute as general welfare types of services, would there be any reason that the safe harbors would exclude any service or activity that's otherwise funded by the feds to tribes for activities or benefits for tribal members. Yeah, I don't see any reason why. I, I don't see that it, it that it would. Um, in prior audits that I've handled, I've you know I've never had a situation where the agent would include that type of benefit if it's you know federally funded or. In, so, they funded, so right. I don't see so, why it would. So then my, my kind of follow-up question on that would be like, you know, when we're talking about oh, elders' issues or child care issues or education funding or housing funding, all of those activities are funded on a mandatory formula basis by the feds to tribes. And usually most of those funding streams give tribes the, uh, some flexibility in defining how they will provide services with those formula funds. So would that provide a model that would also protect tribes from, uh, from these type of audits? Do you get what I'm saying? If somebody says, for instance, oh, I don't know, um, in order to access certain housing benefits that the um, that Nahasda says income level has to be to X. And then the tribe, by providing additional funding that isn't federal to meet additional need, raises that need uh, amount up to Y. It would still be the same activity that's federally funded. It would just be providing a greater level of benefit to more tribal people. Right, yeah. Well, uh, I think that, um, you know, that sort of, I mean, that's a good point. You know, should, should the safe harbors cover that sort of situation where you're sort of building on a federal program or state program already or using right. a formulaic, uh, a sort of a formulaic benefit program that, that mirrors that same other federal program? So the question would be, do we, add, do we ask to have that added as a safe har type of safe harbor program? That's a good question. Um, but the other is that certainly under the general welfare ex exclusion rules, generally, as Robert was talking about it in the beginning of this conference, um, if it doesn't fit within the safe harbor, it may still fit 
within the general welfare exclusion. And I, and I would argue that that sort of uh, program that you're talking about or that sort of funding um, would fall under the uh, general welfare exclusion, if not in the safe harbor. Oh, that would be really neat. OK, thank you. Thank you so much for taking my question. Hey, but this is John again. Should we move on to the cultural programs? I, I think if, if we don't get to the cultural programs, then we haven't done our job today. Um, and we've asked Derek Bitzo is an attorney with NCAI, and, and we've asked him if he would talk a little bit about the comments on the um, on the cultural programs. Definitely, John. Thank you. Um, so, just if you look at the housing programs and the education programs. And, and how they fall under the safe harbor. Um, when we talk about tribal cultural programs, there's something kind of uniquely different. And I think it's the fact that these cultural programs sometimes get to the innate character of tribal people. And so, you know, looking at the cultural programs, we kind of, we've heard from tribes, um, one tribal leader in particular, that basically said, when you have um, these programmatic requirements, like the written guidelines, et cetera, and the lavish and extravagant threshold, and you apply that to tribal cultural and religious programs, um, sometimes if you get too specific with what's needed, it might actually lead to tribes having to alter their own cultures and traditions to fit IRS guidelines. So this particular area was, was, um, was kind of um, in, in different from the others in the way we addressed it. But you'll see right here under E, this is what the guidance set forth as uh, falling under the safe harbor. And it's basically um, payments or reimbursements for travel expenses um, to attend an Indian tribe's cultural, social, or community activities, such as powwow ceremonies and traditional dances. And this payment and travel expenses covers transportation, food, and lodging. And then number two states payments or reimbursements for travel expenses to visit other Indian reservations or sites that are culturally and historically significant for tribes. The third section is payments or reimbursements the cost of, for the cost of receiving instruction about an Indian tribe's culture, history, and traditions. For example, traditional language, music, and dances. And then the last section under four is payments or reimbursements for funeral and burial expenses and expenses of hosting or attending wakes, funerals, burials, or similar, similar bereavement activities. And when we get to our comments, um, we sort of address them, them one by one. Um, as far as participation, um, it was limited in, in the initial um, safe harbors, but we were saying that it might also include participating in or sponsoring the activities or ceremonies. And, and you'll note in our comments that says for, for some tribes, they have specific, specific ceremonies that can last for a week or more. And in these ceremonies, somebody from the community is uh, selected as a sponsor and part of their duties is clearing the area, erecting temporary shelters and cooking areas, and feeding hundreds of members and their families throughout the week-long ceremonial events. So the item that we highlighted was, um, without this assistance, many couldn't afford to continue these traditions. So this should be included within, within the safe harbors. And when we were going through the session, we noted a lot of different areas. A lot of tribes do things very differently. And so the reimbursements for these activities will look very different depending on what tribe you're, 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 you're dealing with. And, um, and we also saw that some tribes have awards to individuals that participate in cultural, traditional, or religious activities. These awards are kind of um, a, a way that the tribe as a governing authority incentivizes the community to continue participating in tribal traditions, practices, and in a way this, um, this actually fosters the passing on to, to next generations of the traditional knowledge and, and culture of Indian tribes. And then when we look to the bereavement events, um, I'll scroll down here. When we look to the bereavement events, sometimes tribes have different, um, different ways that they approach bereavement ceremonies. So some tribes might conduct memorials and, um, and host sporting events in memory of the deceased, uh, such as um, horse riding events or, or things of that nature. And so when we're talking about bereavement events, that, that, that overarching theme of deference to the tribal government came in here, you know, as well as all these tribal cultural programs, is the tribe has to be able to have the deference to make those determinations of who receives the benefits and, and what those benefits look like. Um, and then we moved on to religious programs other than those described in the notice. 
and this would cover, um, you know, the, the safe harbors apply uh, to traditional cultures, but this uh, fails to cover non-traditional religious activities such as prayer retreats or regional church meetings that an Indian tribe might want to support by assisting members with transportation expenses. And those of you in Indian country know that uh, tribes are very diverse, and, and, and part of that diversity stretches to, to their belief systems as well. So, you know, for different tribes, you'll have some that are, are very traditional, and then you'll have other tribes, uh, tribal members that go to church and, and might practice the same religions that are off the reservation as well. So those are the comments that we came up for um, under this, this program. And now we'll look to, um, to questions here. Well, maybe because of the shortness of the time and, and the, because the issues are related, there's also a safe harbor provision on uh, cultural activities. And we asked Mike Will, uh, Michael Willis to talk a little bit about that. Michael is an attorney with the um, Hobbs Strauss Dean & Walker. Michael, are you there? Yes, I am, John. Can you hear me? Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I think the um, you know as Derek has laid out the uh, so the needs based uh, or the uh, the religious program activity side of the um, guidance on on the general welfare application to the cultural program activities. An important element in the um, the second safe harbor. You know, Robert Yoder identified there are two types of safe harbors. One related to to needs, and the second related to compensation as under the general welfare exclusion from income, basically payments that are considered compensation for services are, are not general welfare excluded, but they're considered taxable, essentially compensation for services. You're, someone's paying someone to perform a task, and this is employment, and thus it's income. Um, well, as this process got going with the IRS on the general welfare doctrine, tribes were really contesting that the IRS was considering gifts and payments to cultural leaders for performing traditional ceremonial functions as taxable events as compensation for services. Um, and many tribal leaders and representatives in the dialogue with IRS really pointed out IRS was intruding into fundamentals cultural heritage practices in a manner that was antithetical to the reciprocal community relationships and the sacred, spiritual, and cultural traditions of the tribe. Um, in fact, many of the tribal representatives, some of the dialogues with IRS gave examples of how it would be culturally offensive to have to issue a 1099 form when uh, awarding a cultural leader a blanket for performing a ceremony or issuing 1099s for those who are receiving funds to carry out ceremonial or tradition function, or traditional functions such as feasts. Um, so these items were put forward loud and clear to the IRS in the um, discussion of the general welfare doctrine. And I think uh, in looking at this safe harbor, it's a, a, a unique feature to this tribal general welfare uh, um, exclusion program is that it, it's essentially taking the view that items that are of cultural significance or of nominal cash value that are provided to medicine men or women, shamans, religious or spiritual officials that recognize their participation in cultural, religious, or social events you know, we're looking at powwows, rites of passage ceremonies, or the many activities that Derek just described, and such as bereavement events. Um, so the the idea here is when um, some someone is receiving a, a cultural leader, a, a spiritual leader is, is receiving um, a gift or some form of compensation for performing those services. It's not going to fall within their, the IRS's idea of compensation for services, but it would not be uh, deemed compensation for services but a general welfare benefit uh, that's excludable from tax. Um, and so I think in this sense there's a significant conceptual breakthrough with IRS, but there's a number of ways where the, the guidance needs to go further and, and tribes have identified a, a handful of them here that are set forth in the, um, the comments document. I mean the first one is, is really a, um, getting right to the heart of the issue of de deference to tribal culture and tradition. You know, the IRS really doesn't have a role here, and there shouldn't be any regulatory activity of the federal government in tribes' uh, internal cultural um, heritage practices and, and ceremonial activities. So really the fundamental piece here is, is essentially this is, this is a, uh, an area that is outside the federal uh, jurisdiction, and, they, and IRS and Treasury should just really just be, not be involved in this whatsoever. Um, these are activities reserved for the tribe. They're activities that tribes have been doing long before the, the United States formed. So it's essentially, you know, stay out of our business here is, is really the message. And, and uh, um, there, there are 
several, I think in terms of Kim's comments earlier, that sort of the idea here is to, to say, you know, the IRS just should, should be out of, the, out of this. Now that they've acknowledged it's not compensation for services, there's, there's really no reason to, to dig in any deeper. Um, but then there's sort of a set of three other items that we've identified that, that folks have raised uh, as, as we've looked at this issue. Um, and it's sort of the way IRS has de defined this um, uh, special safe harbor for compensation. Um, they've identified um, the spiritual officials um, in, a, in a way that may be quite narrow, and, and, and I, again, this is that question I think that Kim raised in the comments earlier, that, that um, we can specify uh, these issues or we can offer some interpretive guidance, but certainly in this uh, instance we have an example of a term, of terminology that uh, we're at risk of the IRS applying too narrowly as who is a spiritual leader and who is not a spiritual leader that's eligible for um, the exclusion. Uh, there's another one of these, and there is a reference to the term not nominal. They're, they describe that these um, uh, nominal cash honoraria provided to medicine men or women, shamans, or similar religious or spiritual officials um, would be not uh, compensation. But the question is, well, what, what does nominal mean? There, there's some, uh, the IRS has traditionally applied something like a $25 standard as being sort of a nominal payment. And certainly there are many examples where blankets that are being given in, uh, in recognition of the services provided for ceremonial activity, there are payments in cash that are considerably more substantial than that um, in light of the services provided or, or the ceremonial role performed by a, a, a cultural leader. And so the idea here is looking at, well, the, the question of what compensation would be excluded from income would be that which would be reasonable under the circumstances in light of the, the, the cultural traditions of the tribe. Um, and then there's this another uh, uh, term, officials, relating to tribal officials who would um, benefit from this provision. And again, uh, this seems somewhat incongruent with what the IRS has said, they, because tribal officials may not capture the folks who are, who are really intended to benefit, and those are the, the medicine men, the spiritual leaders, uh, the, the shamans who, are, who um, would be receiving the kind of reciprocal gifts for uh, performing these services. So those are the, the issues that I think have been raised as, as, as concerns in the comments to really uh, consolidate and advance the, uh, the, this uh, safe harbor for compensation for cultural uh, heritage activities. So I think those are the, the main comments uh, I Thank wanted to raise at this point. Um, Derek, how much time do we have left in our webinar today? Uh, we have 28 minutes, John. 28 minutes left. All right. Well, there's, I mean, two more things we really wanted to do. Uh, one is just to get questions generally, and and then I think questions on the cultural area are really important. And then, um, and then also, uh, Will Micklin is going to talk a little bit about the. Um, the recommendation that an advisory committee be formed. Um, but I, I guess I think that this, uh, this cultural resources area is so important, maybe we should take questions now related to that. Uh, does that make sense to you, Derek? Uh, it makes sense to me. We have a couple questions. They're, they're more broad questions about um, the overall safe harbors right now, and we'll wait for the cultural questions to come in. But right now, uh, one of the questions is, and it gets back to the, the education section that Kathleen was addressing, if Distance learning is covered. How about providing a computer? Would that be covered under distance learning as well? Sorry. Um, repeat the question, please. Yes. Uh, the question is, if distance learning is covered, how about providing a computer? Would that be covered under distance learning? Um, don't know if it would be. Uh, covered under that, but definitely it would be. It, it is specifically covered under the first safe harbor that says provide students um, uh, a number of things, and it, it it mentions laptop computers for use in their studies. So, I mean, certainly, uh, I, I'm sure there wasn't an intent to to limit it just to laptop computers versus other types of computers. But yeah, I'm I'm confident that that would would fall under the first safe harbor, whether it was, and, and again, um, distance learning would certainly be, I, I think, um, fall under that first safe harbor because you would be a student and it doesn't really define that you have to be 
um, doing your studies at a school uh, institution, brick and mortar. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, we got a, a really good question uh, right now, and it goes to what Michael was just covering, the compensation for services issue. And it says, uh, for cultural, would compensation to tribal cultural experts for NAGPRA-related activities be covered under the safe harbor? Yeah, that's a really, really good question, and, and certainly in the dialogue with IRS on, on this, um, this topic, um, I think the IRS Treasury folks were really trying to get a grapple with sort of what are professional services or um, maybe in the case of performers entertainment services which were might would be treated differently than say cultural um, ceremonial services so I I, um, I, I don't I, I would say there's probably some some uh, lack of clarity in, in the scope of it, but I, I, I would expect that when you look at what IRS has kind of uh, played with here is the kind of services provided you know, on the NAGPRA issue, particularly when you're talking about experts who have particular technical and professional training that they're, those activities are, are, again, professional as opposed to ceremonial. But there would be another side of that, at, for, for, for instance, if they're sort of re-internment ceremonies or proper burial ceremonies that would clearly be performed by cultural figures that would be exempt. So I, I think that um, there, there, may, there is a, something of a distinction between the tribal, you know, cultural, historic, or, or traditional ceremonial function and, and those which are, are professional and uh, or, or sort of entertainment oriented. So I think that's, that may, be, may cover the distinction on, on that point. Okay, and, and a follow-up to that, Michael. Um, we got a comment from Dan, and he notes that council meetings are cultural as well. Are fees paid for attending a council meeting taxable? Would the amount be relevant? Honorariums, travel expenses, and stipends? That's an, inter an interesting point, that, that indeed the way a tribal council functions is part of uh, carrying out the traditional culture and, and cultural uh, activities of the tribe. I, I um, I think it's, it's an issue that we could push and discuss, but I, I think it may come up with that same kind of dis distinction that, well, is there, you know, between uh, those figures who are performing a, a more uh, spiritual ceremonial role, and again, this is just different with every tribe, and uh, there may be lines of distinction in terms of what is, uh, you know, deemed a, a cultural or, or heritage or a, a spiritual or ceremonial function and, and what is a, a governance function carried out by, you know, you know uh, politicians and professionals for the tribe. So I, I think there's a really important question of where, where does the, tr the line get drawn in, these, in, in this area. Definitely. And, and, and also there's um, another follow-up question to that too, and it's how about compensation to board members for housing, cultural education, or other governance questions, or other governance activities? And that might not be in the, in the cultural, but I'll just open it up to the panel to see if um, maybe perhaps Robert or Kathleen or, or Mary have, a, have an answer for that question. This is Kathleen. I'll, I'll take this on. Um, in the past, the IRS has made it fairly clear that they do consider compensation uh, that's paid to board members, commission members, uh, and other similar positions to be taxable. Uh, and they, in fact, uh, would prefer to see it taxed as wages uh, and a W-2 issued. Um, so i not I, I don't see an opening here within this guidance to take that issue on, uh, but I know I know it's it's very much an issue how it should be treated. Um, is it taxable and and is it employee uh, compensation? Is it independent contractor? Is it it's some other form of compensation? But um, it's it's definitely something that the IRS in the past has indicated um, that they would view uh, most appropriately treated as, as wages, except for um, tribal council pay, which is not treated as wages for Social Security purposes. 
This is Mary. I agree with what you're saying, Kathleen. I think the guidance was very, very intentional in limiting any um, otherwise compensatory payments uh, as as qualifying for the safe harbor. They're really only looking to shelter very, very nominal payments for specifically uh, religious and cultural purposes. Yeah, I think, you know, as a bit of background, um, this this was an area that we were, um, you know, it didn't go far far enough, as Michael said, but when we saw it, we, we definitely thought that um, it was definitely a change of direction because this idea of compensation for services is one of the key core functions of the general welfare exclusion as applied everywhere else. So for them to make a cultural exception for tribes, they really listened to tribes and, and heard what we were saying about this. And I think um, what was hard for them to grasp at first was understanding that uh, tribal governments do have, um, as part of their functions and duties, trying to preserve the culture and traditions of of, of their communities, and um, I think you know one of the big barriers that they had was this um, separation between church and state that that would that folks from the IRS are used to of um, uh, the government staying out of re religion and 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 not funding uh, religion. Um, the, I guess the the um, the I guess the religious activities, and so for them to to see that from a tribal perspective was something that 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 was good, and I think that we should note that. Um, so. You know, as Mary said and as Kathleen said, that there is this, um, this this attempt to try to funnel it down to just this, what is what is cultural, is it what is traditional, and it's things outside of government. It's kind of the way I, I interpreted it. This is Ron. Am, am I still alive? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Good. Yes? Yes. Uh, well, I, um, I guess one of the general questions I, I would have on these areas, um, I, I find these questions uh, interesting because um, they, they, in each of these areas, um, there are so many variations of, of whether or not they should be considered exempt or not, and um, because each tribal will administer them just a little bit different. Um, there may be some common threads, but I'm a little concerned about uh, guidelines that, that try to get too specific. And, and inadvertently uh, miss how some tribes may um, apply these, these practices. Uh, um, and, and going to Derek's example of the religious and cultural traditional practices, um, you know, you, sometimes you think of this that uh, traditional ceremonial um, um, uh, roles that some of our medicine men or, or um, um, you know, presiders over these events, um, that we compensate them. Um, I, I mean, I, I want to park the whole issue of, of what is reasonable or can there have, how uh, uh, Michael referenced that, 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 that phrase of what is an acceptable, reasonable um, fee. But <clears throat> there's many ways in which that we, we address that particular topic. I, I'm thinking of a couple of examples in my own area where we, we're, there's this renaissance of a canoe journey. And inside that, you know, we compensate um, elders um, um, who are experts on our traditional practices um, with regard to um, how the, the protocols of potlatches, et cetera. And, um, and then we cover their travel and all that kind of stuff. So you see that's very different. Um, and of course they don't do that in the Great Plains or they don't do that in Great Lakes, but nevertheless there may be similar kinds of functions. And I guess I'm, we have to be careful what we want, how we want them to how we want IRS to reference what is exempt um, with regard to these kinds of, of activities. And I just seem to think that, uh, that they need to be able to reference it so that the tribes can have a policy that covers how it, how it is applied within our community. I don't, I don't know if that makes sense to you, but it just seems to me we've got to be careful from this national versus the tribal specific um, application. I think I think that's an excellent point, Chairman Allen, um, and and probably a, a good point to close this this conversation off on on cultural, just because of our time constraints. Because I think we could talk about this for a while, but just to reiterate what I said earlier, 
Uh, we are committing to follow up on all the questions. So if we didn't answer your question, uh, we have a list of all the questions that were asked and we'll make sure that we follow up via email. Um, so now we're going to move on to the establishment of an advisory committee. And this is a, a section that we asked Will Micklin to address. Uh, so Will, are you on? Yeah, Derek, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hi, Will Micklin. I'm the Executive Director for California Association of Tribal Governments and First Vice President for uh, Central Council of Click and Hyder Tribes of Alaska and uh, CEO for Weepi Tribe. The, the, uh, the IOTI is uh, recommending that there be a Secretary's Advisory Committee the um, IRS Advisory uh, Committee, of which I'm a, a member in its 2012 uh, report, um, made the same recommendation. And we will repeat that in our 2013 report that will be published on uh, June 10th of this year. The uh, Advisory Committee, we feel, is necessary because the uh, IRS for a number of reasons, and I'm going to hit three areas in this brief discussion. The first is uh, rationale for the recommendation. The IRS uh, general welfare exclusion guidelines are a policy that are subject to change. They're not published as a PLR. They're not in regulation. They're not in statute. And therefore, different regimes, different administrations could have different interpretations of the policy. Um, the, there are, as well, and not just uh, general welfare exclusion, but other issues affecting Indian country as well, like the integral part determination for tribal instrumentalities, such as tribal law corporations and their tax status, the central government function test. Uh, we talked about the qualified insurance plan for uh, Indians on the Affordable uh, Care Act, 139, Section 139D. It was addressed in the general welfare uh, guidelines, uh, but uh, still subject to change. And the point with the 139B is it was caused by tax council's opinion that was, in essence, contrary to the plain language of the Affordable Care Act. So there, there is a reason for there to be some sound counsel within the service, within Department of Treasury, that can provide uh, uh, a context of what tribal issues, tribal interests, and tribal views would be on a subject before they render an opinion. Um, there's the recent PLR and tribal participation in renewable energy partnerships, wherein it was um, they um, uh, took their view and, and not acknowledging tribes as governments for that specific purpose of that tax treatment which is uh, another indication of the different positions that the service can take uh, with regard to tribes. So there's a number of issues of importance that would be the subject matter for an advisory committee. Uh, the second area is that uh, the model here is the Department of Health and Human Services Secretary's Advisory Committee. I'm looking at a very nice report published by the uh, uh, DHHS Stack um, Committee is the annual report published January 17th of 2013, and it is contains the kind of discussion on tribal interests and priorities and values and their um, impact um, by HHS programs <coughs> that should be the subject for a Treasury and, and IRS report. Uh, this is much attributable to uh, Stacy Ekafi, who's the advisor in the secretary's office, and Lillian Sparks, who's a and commissioner. So we absolutely need folks of that quality who are tribal, um, tribal leaders that work within the Treasury, as they do within HHS, with great success. Uh, the third uh, area is um, uh, just about the uh, that position. Right now, that position within Treasury is a Deputy Secretary position. Aaron Klein worked in that position uh, uh, with great uh, success. Uh, Elaine Buckberg is the new appointee to that position. Um, and although they, uh, Aaron did 
uh, very well in that position. There was some ramp up time. It's a short term position because it's an appointee position and we think that this committee would provide some institutional continuity uh, within the department. Uh, one reason I would point to that is the 2002 Chief Counsel Advice uh, Memorandum on Essential Government Function Test within uh, the meaning of uh, Section 7871E of the Internal Revenue Code, wherein the, the Council acknowledged that the facts uh, favored tribes uh, with uh, regard to the, and this was a question of whether um, tribes uh, bonds were tax exempt or not under 7871E. And it, it was an interesting discussion where the, the Chief Counsel discussed that uh, if litigated, the courts would likely favor tribes, that the rules of construction favor tribes, that uh, they would likely, uh, that a service would not, uh, would not uh, win a ruling if brought to litigation. So they, the advice was not to go to litigation. And IRS doesn't need to litigate. They have the powers of enforcement and assessment. Uh, so it would be up to tribes to defend themselves. This type of position, we feel, would provide the advice, would provide the rational discussion that would better inform and educate uh, the service uh, before they act on uh, opinions of tax counsel, which are uninformed by folks that have experience within, within Indian country. Uh, finally, we did um, also recommend that there be an undersecretary for Indian Affairs position established as a career or appointee position within the department to provide that kind of one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, advice that Stacey Ecofee provides to Secretary Sebelius in HHS and that Lillian Sparks also provides uh, for ANA to the secretary. Uh, there are uh, many issues uh, in addition to general welfare exclusion that need this type of uh, advice where Indian country can communicate effectively with the Department of Treasury Secretary and the Commissioner of, of the uh, Internal Revenue Service. And uh, you know, until Treasury actually publishes a tribal consultation policy, which they have not as of yet, uh, this is going to be uh, uh, an important issue for us to pursue with uh, the service and with the uh, Treasury and with the administration as well. So uh, those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Um, and we just had a couple of comments on that. Uh, one one um, attendee said it might be helpful to add that an advisory committee is consistent with the President's Memorandum for Consultation, Executive Order 13175. And uh, this, this will make it clear that this request is being tied to existing federal policy supported by the administration. That comment is from Kim. I think that's a good comment. And we also had a request that um, if you would be willing to share the HHS report to the people on the call. So um, I will get with Will and see if I can get my hands on the HHS report and send that out in my email. And right now we have um, some other questions. Um, to follow up on Ryan. one was get into um, it said what is it meant and this I think this goes to either Kathleen or um, or Mary's comments earlier what is it meant when when you say that tribal council pay is not considered for Social Security purposes oh this is Kathleen um, I made that comment it it means that um, uh, elected tribal council pay According to uh, a longstanding IRS ruling, uh, is not subject to FICA taxes, and uh, as a result, um, it is also that, that I guess the the exemption is the upside. Uh, the downside is uh, service as a tribal council member and the compensation associated with that would not. Um, serve to help someone um, uh, compile a Social Security earnings record and I guess could if someone's exclusive role was as a tribal council member with no other employment prior to retirement um, could leave the council member not able to 
to tap into Social Security, I guess worst, worst case scenario, or uh, to have reduced benefits. So a lot of tribes that I'm currently working with are looking at um, other means of providing for the retirement of tribal council members, um, uh, particularly if, if they do not have a large per capita payment that's available to members. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, at this moment, you know, we have a couple minutes left. I wanted to know if um, any of the folks, any of the panels had some closing comments they wanted to offer. I know uh, sometimes you hear something that somebody's talking about and you, you wish you'd have a crack at it. And so now's your, now's your chance, guys. Uh, Wendy, Hello, Robert, Steve, anybody want to say something? Well, this is Ron. I'm on the line still. I, I, I think that what I would, one thing I want to say, picking up on Will's comments, is that um, at the high level, the, uh, set aside what the, the, you know, the more technical advisory committee that Will sits on, that we do need a, uh, a staff type meeting or staff type council, advisory council for for um, treasury, because uh, there's a bigger. It, it covers all the issues, the tax issues and the uh, uh, general welfare issues, et cetera. So um, it's a bigger picture issue, and uh, and we need some some vehicle to engage with the treasury. Um, uh, uh, top officials. Thank you, Chairman. I would just like to, to follow up on Will's suggestion, too. I think it, it makes a lot of sense, um, and, and I, um, I want to thank Will for highlighting the fact that since this is a, um, an appointed position, the position that Mr. Klein um, held so eloquently and that Ms. Buckberg is moving into, since it is an appointed position, um, as new people come in, we're always going through the education phase, and, and it does it would make a world of a difference to have an advisory committee that was stable and in place that could um, kind of serve that function when, when they're going through administrative changes. So um, with that, um, I know uh, John had to take off. He had another call he had to get on, as did Jackie. Uh, if there's no, no other closing comments, and I just want to thank everybody for attending, thanking everybody for taking time out of their day to join us. And uh, we appreciate uh, all the feedback and all the input. We will follow up on the questions. And we will also take the input that we received today and uh, make sure that we incorporate it into the final comments. I also wanted to note that this was uh, seen as kind of the first of two webinars. So this was the webinar to address the draft comments. And then later on, the comments, as we noted earlier, are due June 3rd. We want to have a follow-up webinar, so part two, where uh, we can kind of show the final product before we turn it in. So uh, we'll, we'll send that information as it becomes available to the folks that register for this. And then we'll also uh, put broadcasts out, too, so you can tell your friends and, and we can all have uh, fun like we did for the past two hours. So uh, if there's anybody else um, there, yeah, this, 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 is, this is Dante. I just wanted to um, thank you for hosting the, the call and going over all the different provisions. Um, as far as receiving other comments, I think um, it would be appropriate to, to say that uh, we, if you want to send them in to any of the respective organizations, then we can start assembling those. And also, we want to strongly urge uh, tribes to submit their own comments to um, the IRS uh, on their um, uh, general welfare um, exclusions. Definitely. Thank you, Dante. Well, um, if that's it, then I guess we can wrap it up. And um, this is recorded, so we will uh, send that out as well, too. Thank you very much, everybody, and um, we thank you. Goodbye. Nice job, everybody. Thank you.